Okay, so osmosis is the movement of water molecules from an area of higher water potential to an area of lower water potential across a partially permeable membrane. So what does this mean? This means that you have an area. Let's just uh, draw a test tube here. So you have a specific type of test tube maybe to display uh, osmosis. You have a semi-permeable membrane here. So um, on the left side, you have water. Maybe this is the level of water here. On the right side as well, this is the level of water. So on the left side, you would have uh, some solute, right? On the right side, you also have a little bit of solute. Now, when we look at it, we see that the left side is more concentrated, right? Left side is hypertonic. Hypertonic is more concentrated, and on the right side is hypotonic. Less concentration on the right side. So when we look at the water content as compared to the solute content, then the left side has less water per, as compared to the solute concentration, while the right side has more water comparable to the solute concentration. This term actually, or basically the concentration of water on the left is lesser and on the right is higher. This is put uh, or defined by a word called, um, called water potential. So on the left, we would have less water concentration per unit solute, so less water potential. Okay, less water potential. While on the right side, which is the dilute solution, you'll have higher water potential. This means that water has an unevenness, a difference in concentration going on. So water, because it is a fluid, it also has the ability to move. Now, water will try to move to the right as we look at it because we've got higher water potential, more water concentration on the right as compared to the left. While solute concentration is more to the left as compared to the right, the solute will try to move to the right. However, the partially permeable membrane that I put here, so this is the membrane that I put, this membrane has slits that only allow water to go through. It does not allow the solute to go through. So solute movement will be prevented. Solute will not be allowed to go to the, to the right, but water is allowed to go to the left, which means that water will start moving to the left until concentrations on both sides is equal. So um, a short while later, what you'll see is that, and let's remake this. So a short while later, what you will see is that you've got water over here that has so water on the left has increased. Water from the right has moved to the left. Well, water on the right has decreased. Mm -hmm. Until, and this would keep on occurring until the concentration on both sides is relatively equal. Okay? And that is called osmosis. So osmosis is the movement of water from an area of higher water potential to an area of lower water potential across a semi-permeable membrane. You could also define this as uh, movement of water from an area of lower concentration, dilute solution, to an area of higher solute concentration, concentrated solution. Okay. Uh, a key concepts here, or some key words that you need to remember are, number one, solute. What is a solute? Solute is the substance that is dissolved in a solvent. For example, in this case, we have these red particles that are dissolved in water. Solvent. Solvent is a liquid in which the solute is dissolved. For example, in this case, we have water that is dissolving the red colored dots, the solutes. Concentrated versus dilute. A solution that has a high solute concentration and dilute solution would have a low solute concentration. Concentrated solution is also called a hypertonic solution, which has a lower water potential. Dilute solution is also called a hypotonic solution, which has a higher water potential. Osmosis always occurs from a dilute to a concentrated solution, from a higher water potential area to a lower water potential area. So why is osmosis important? Osmosis is very important for the following purposes. We have cells. For example, <clears throat> you could have an animal cell. 
Of course, we've studied animal cells, so I'm just going to draw an animal cell here. Okay, let's say this is an animal cell, and then this animal cell uh, has water on the inside and has water on the outside, right? And on the inside, the concentration is greater of the solute, whatever that is, as compared to the outside. So if outside concentration is greater than the inside, then the outside solution is hypertonic or hypotonic? Outside solution is hypotonic, right? So does the outside solution have a higher water potential or a lower water potential? Can you tell me? It has a higher water potential on the outside and a lower water potential on the inside because inside is hypertonic. So water will move from the dilute solution outside to the concentrated solution inside. Movement of water into the cell. Now this will increase as water fills up in the cell. This will increase the size of the cell, right? And as if this keeps on occurring, uh, the cell will build up hydrostatic pressure, the pressure that is being, being exerted, by, exerted by the water on the cell membrane, and eventually the pressure builds up so much that it might even just burst, okay? Become so big that it eventually bursts out, bursts out, okay? So bursting of the cell. You can just write it as bursting if they ask you, or you can also write this as cyto cytolysis. Cyto means cell and lysis means breaking or breakage. So bursting or cy cytolysis would occur if you have um, an animal cell that is receiving water. Well, question is, what would happen if an animal cell starts losing water? What would happen then? Well, let's have a look, right? So for that, the conditions should be that the animal cell is present in a concentrated solution. So let's get an animal cell here again, and let's make this dilute. So this animal cell is dilute as compared to the outside solution. Uh, here's the outside solution, and let's make this very concentrated. So it's very, very concentrated right now on the outside. Now in this case, uh, the inside is hypotonic, right? Inside is hypotonic, so which means inside has high water potential, while outside is hypertonic, which means low water potential. So water will move from high water potential, hypotonic solution, to, in, to a hyper, uh, hypertonic, um, low water potential solution. Water will move outside. So as water starts moving outside the cell, the cell is going to become dehydrated. It's go going, to, going to lose water. It will shrink. So maybe the cell you know, becomes a bit smaller and dehydrated. And eventually, if too much dehydration occurs, it can even become very spiky and you know, pointy. It's a small, spiky, or pointy cell. And that is called a crenated cell, OK? Crenated cell. So cells can become crenated. Crenated is, a, is an extremely dehydrated cell. But this is temporarily reversible, which means that it will not die just yet, temporarily uh, reversible. If you supply water to it within uh, a short period of time, then it will probably come back to life and still be alive. However, bursting always kills the cell, okay? Cytolysis kills the cell, cell dies if this occurs. Crenation, uh, very severe dehydration, does not actually kill the cell. Uh, for a brief period of time, you have a brief window in which if you rehydrate it, then um, this will uh, start becoming normal again. However, if a uh, cell bursts, cytolysis occurs, then it is completely dead, okay? So that is what happens if water moves in or out of animal cells. What about plant cells? What would occur in plant cells? And it's very, very important, okay? So here's plant cells. Remember, plant cells would not look like animal cells, and they have a cell wall. So they have a regular shape. For example, in this case, I'm drawing sort of like a, a rectangular shape, and they have a cell wall. Very important concept. They have a cell wall. Okay, so in the case of plant cells, if water were to move into the plant cells, that would require the outside environment to be hypotonic and inside environment of the cell to be hypertonic. So let's make this inside concentrated, especially if we had to have a vacuole, a small vacuole here, and the inside of the cell is very concentrated. 
which means that there is a difference in water potential. Outside is high water potential and inside is low water potential. So water will move from a high water potential region, which is outside, to a low water potential region, which is on the inside. As water moves into the cell, it's going to cause the cell to swell up. And, it's caused, and also, it's going to cause the cell's vacuole to increase in size. So as the vacuole increases in size and the cell swells up, it does not burst, right? It does not burst. Comparable to the animal cell, which does burst, plant cell does not burst. And also, it does not change its shape any significantly. And the reason for this is because the cell wall is able to bear all of that pressure that is being generated because of water moving in. So you've got all this water on the inside, which is generating a very high pressure state, just like filling up a balloon. But the balloon is not bursting because you've got a cell wall around it, okay? So what do we call this cell that has now become pressurized? Well, we have a name for this, and you need to remember this name. This is very, very important. The name that we give to a pressurized uh, cell, plant cell, is called a turgid cell. Okay, the cell has become turgid, or it has achieved something called turgidity. Okay, turgidity. So a hydrated, well-hydrated cell, plant cell, is turgid. Okay, and that's uh, phenomena of being pressurized due to water is called turgidity. So how is this important for a plant? That uh, takes us to another very important concept. So how is this important for a plant? Well, for a plant, for it to be able to uh, to uh, to stand upright and to be able to support itself, it needs to be uh, it needs to have some sort of strength to it. And one of the ways in which the leaves and the stems of a plant get strength is by having turgidity in their cells, for their cells to be pressurized. What I mean by this is that if you have a plant, right, um, and it's dehydrated, so it's de if it's dehydrated, it's, its leaves are just gonna, uh, just gonna wilt down and they're just gonna be, you know, uh, lying down and building down. You can try this in your, actually don't torture a plant, don't try this at home, but you are probably aware that if you stop watering a plant, what would happen is that its leaves are just going to go down and they're not going to be very pressurized. And uh, the reason for this is because they don't have turgidity. So if you water this plant, let's say you water this plant, right? If you provide this with water, what's going to happen is that water is going to move into this plant and eventually it's going to move into the cells. The cells are going to become hydrated and they're going to become turgid. When the cells become turgid, then the leaves and the stems would have the turgidity to be able to stand upright and be a happy plant. Mm -hmm. Now it's really, really happy. Yay. Um, while on the left side, it looks a bit sad, right? And miserable because it's very dehydrated. So very happy when it's turgid, sad and building when it's dehydrated. Similarly, if water was to move out of plant cells, what would occur? Right, remember in animal cells, if water moves out, then the cells become very pointy and spiky. Uh, we call that crenated cells. Plant cells, if water moves out, again, you have the cell wall. Cell wall is very rigid and it maintains the regular shape of the plant cell, which means that it would not change its shape no matter what. It didn't change its shape when we put in a lot of water. If you take out a lot of water, again, it will not, it's not going to change a lot, much of its shape. So let's have a look. Again, the conditions for water to move out would be that you have a a hypotonic solution on the inside and hypertonic solution on the outside. For example, you take a plant cell and you dip it in a very concentrated solution of sugar or something, right? So here's a plant cell and then it would have some concentration and you put it maybe in a solution of full of sugar or something else that is very concentrated. So you put it around a very concentrated solution such as this, as I'm drawing, there is a difference of water potential, which means that water is going to start moving out from high water potential inside the cell to low water potential outside the cell. So as water moves out, especially from the vacuole of this plant, the vacuole is going to shrink and the cell is going to shrink. When the cell shrinks, when the cell shrinks, the cell wall does not change its shape. The cell wall remains as it is. However, the vacuole is going to become smaller 
and the cell membrane is going to come off the cell wall at particular intervals. Okay? And that is called plasmolysis. So we have a plasmolysis cell, plasmolysis. And this cell, cell is said to be plasmolyzed. This is when the cell becomes dehydrated, when it loses water, and that results in wilting. Okay, wilting of the plant would occur when the cells of it are plasmalized, when they uh, lose water, when they are dehydrated, or when they are put <coughs> in a very uh, concentrated solution. So again, wilting is basically the leaves hanging down, and uh, over here, the uh, this is a turgid plant, and the leaves are uh, right way up, okay? So that's a very, very important concept, and we'll hopefully look at some pictures of some crenated cells, some turgid cells, some plasmolite cells, and hopefully you will remember this even better, okay? Okay, all right, so move on. Uh, a couple of other important terms that we've already looked at. Isotonic solutions were solutions with equal concentrations of solutes. So if you have equal concentrations on both sides, then there is no net movement of water or anything else. Mm -hmm. No osmosis. No net osmosis. Hypertonic means high concentration. High solute concentration means that water potential is low. Hypotonic solution has a higher water potential, a solution with lower solute concentration, so that the reference then the reference solution causing water to move into cells. Okay, so a lot uh, basically osmosis is a lot like diffusion, except it is for water only and it is happening across a partially permeable membrane. So we get uh, a meme after finishing osmosis. So you're telling me osmosis is really diffusion, but only for water. Okay, so some really extremely, extremely important concepts related to osmosis, as explained above, is that if water moves into animal cells, they burst. For example, here's a red blood cell, and a lot of water has moved into this red blood cell, and it's bursting right now. If water moves out, they become spiky and crenated. For example, here are, again, red blood cells, but they are dehydrated this time, and they have become crenated, Okay. If water moves into plant cells, they become turgid, and if uh, it moves out of plant cells, they become plasmalized. So maybe, um, how about you guys guess which one of them is turgid and which one of them is plasmalized? So is picture on the left or picture on the right turgid, and is picture on the left or picture on the right plasmalized? Let me know in the comments. Um, next up, we have factors affecting osmosis. Just like we did factors affecting diffusion, osmosis would have similar fact, uh, factors as well. So number one, we have concentration gradient. Remember, uh, the greater the difference in solid concentrations, or basically the greater the difference between water potentials, the faster the rate of osmosis across the uh, semi-permeable membrane. Temperature, higher temperature which would mean greater kinetic energy, which means par particles are moving faster, which means that they are um, doing osmosis faster. Surface area. A larger surface area of the membrane allows for more osmotic movement. Remember, surface area to volume ratio, we spend a good 15 minutes on it. So greater surface area would mean that there is more area available for exchange to occur. Thickness of membrane. Thinner membranes, they facilitate faster osmosis. Um, as Uh, as common sense suggests, right, the thinner the membrane, the uh, faster should be the exchange. So um, how are these processes and why are these processes important? Importance in biology. Cruci this is crucial for processes like water uptake by plant roots, maintenance of cell trigger pressure, and understanding the behavior, uh, behavior of cells in different solutions, okay? Uh, now, one more thing that I want to mention here before we move on is a third type of a third type of exchange of substances. So, number one, we did we did diffusion. Number two, we did osmosis. Number three, we have to do active transport. And hopefully, you can you guys can note this down. I will add this to your notes. Active transport is movement, which is the opposite of diffusion. Remember, diffusion is the passive movement of particles from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration until concentration is equal on both sides. Active transport is the area, is the movement 
of particles from an area of high, no, low concentration to an area of high concentration using energy. Mm -hmm. It uses energy for active transport. Remember when we were talking about root hair cells? And we said that root hair cells, one of the adaptations of root hair cells is that they have a lot of mitochondria so that those mitochondria can generate energy uh, for active transport to occur. Because normally, uh, movement of molecules goes from high concentration to low concentration. Active transport is the opposite of nature. It's going against the natural order of things. And so you need to put in the work and you need to put in the energy which means that you need energy from the mitochondria to drive this work. So examples would be root hair cells. Uh, I can give you one more example, but let me just quickly um, get a sample cell here. So here's a cell, and then let's say that this cell is rich in glucose, so it has a lot of glucose, and here's pink colored glucose. Let's just say this is glucose, and outside is a little bit glucose as well, but glucose is not supposed to be outside of cells. It's supposed to be on the inside. So how do you get this glucose? Uh, from outside to inside, and outside has low concentration, and inside has high concentration. Well, it surely is not going to diffuse inwards, so what you need to do is you need to get special proteins that are going to do active transport, okay? You get these special proteins that will pull them uh, using energy. So these will cause the glucose molecules to go into the cells using energy. Now, examples of uh, active transport that occur is, uh, for example, in root hair cells, right? And intestinal cells for absorption of amino acids and for absorption of glucose. Okay. So, what are some of the areas in, or some of the exchange surfaces that we need to know in GCSE biology? Well, number one, and one of the most important ones, is the exchange of gases that occurs in the lungs, right, in the respiratory system. So, let's have a look at the adaptations that allow the exchange of gases in the lungs. Remember when we started biology, we said that cells contain mitochondria, and mitochondria use oxygen to be able to produce energy, and they produce a waste product called carbon dioxide. And we need to remove carbon dioxide. We need to take in the oxygen, and we need to remove carbon dioxide. For this, we need a system in the body that is able to do so, and that is the respiratory system. The respiratory system, which will be discussed hopefully in the next video uh, as well, is uh, the system that contains the nose uh, and the lungs, right? And I think you are a little bit aware of this, we'll do the details later, but basically it's the lungs that have the ability to be able to gas exchange. Now this information again will be repeated in the next video in its own chapter, but just to give you an example of an exchange surface. Lungs contain these terminal balloon-like portions called alveoli. So basically when you're breathing in, the air is going into the lungs, and as it goes into the lungs, gas exchange would occur in terminal sac-like, balloon-like areas called alveoli, okay? They're not this big, but I'm drawing them big here. They're very, very small. Um, so how does an alveoli look like? Let's have a look. So here is um, an alveoli, let's say, right? So air that you're breathing in is coming in. So this is air that is coming in. Remember, air contains 20% oxygen. It's rich in oxygen and 0.0 something carbon dioxide. So very low in carbon dioxide. Rich in oxygen, low in carbon dioxide. 
blood, especially deoxygenated blood that is coming from respiring tissues, is poor in oxygen and rich in carbon dioxide. So here we have uh, deoxygenated blood, which is low in oxygen and high in carbon dioxide. So what would occur here is that as this blood comes right next to the alveoli, right, diffusion of gases from an area of high concentration or high uh, partial pressure, we call them, for gases uh, to an area of low concentration would occur. So oxygen will start moving in, right, and CO2 is going to start moving out. O2 moves into the blood and CO2 moves out and now the blood becomes oxygenated. Now the blood becomes oxygenated and now it is rich in oxygen and poor in CO2, which means that now this is oxygenated blood and it can go to different tissues in the body, to the muscles, to the brain, to uh, oxygenated blood to perform, um, to help in respiration. So that's, that's a bit of physiology that will re be repeated in the next chapter. But our concern is how the alveoli are adapted for this. How are they adapted for this uh, gas exchange? Well, number one, as you can look, they have this very huge area, right, that is allowing the gas exchange to occur. So we would say they have high surface area to volume ratio, right? That's number one. The first adaptation that we can look at is that they have a lot of surface area to volume ratio, isn't it? Number two is that they have this fresh supply of blood, oxygen, uh, deoxygenated blood that is coming in. Remember, this is deoxygenated blood coming in and oxygenated blood leaving, which means that uh, the blood does not stop here. It keeps on rotating, which maintains the concentration gradient, right? Fresh blood coming in and already exchanged blood, oxygenated blood leaving, which means that there's always a concentration gradient. There's always a difference in concentration between uh, the alveolar air, which is here, and the blood, okay? So continuous blood flow, let's write that down here, continuous flow maintains a steep concentration gradient, okay? The third thing is that they have very thin walls. Actually, their walls are just one cell thick. So this alveolar walls are one cell thick, and the capillary wall, which is also called the endothelium, the capillary walls are called endothelium, they're also one cell thick. So if you have very thin walls, that's one cell thick is the thinnest it can get in biology. If you have very thin walls, very thin, one cell thick, which is the thinnest possible, um, walls, then what you will have is a very short diffusion distance, right? Short diffusion distance. And the third thing, which uh, you might not be tested about, but if it comes up for four marks, then you should write it for the four mar fourth mark, is that they have this thin moisture film. The alveoli have this film of moisture that allows the gases to dissolve into this moisture and then eventually go outside, okay? So they have a thin moisture film. Moisture film allows gases to dissolve and diffuse. So these are four adaptations that I want you to remember, and hopefully if a question on this shows up, you can get full marks on this, okay? Question, how are alveoli adapted for their function? How are lungs adapted for their function? And you can write four points easily on this one, okay? So just to repeat, they have a large surface area, they have thin walls, they have a moist environment, and they have a rich blood supply. And I've already explained how they 
help you and you can read the explanations in your in your notes okay we get a meme and I hear that vaping kills alveoli sacs in your lungs and know that people still vape yeah it's life one of life's greatest mysteries Small intestines. Uh, we just looked at in uh, when we were doing the active transport. We said that one of the examples of where active transport will occur is the intestinal cells in the small intestine, uh, for example. The small intestines are also uh, quite efficient for absorption of food. How does this work? Well, let me quickly show you how the digestive system works. So you have a person, right? And what occurs? Uh, so when this person eats food, the food is uh, going to go into the mouth, right, where it's chewed, and then it's swallowed into the esophagus. And this esophagus is a food pipe that takes it all the way to the stomach. So you'll have the stomach. The stomach contains hydrochloric acid and everything and helps digest the food. And once the food is digested into a liquid, it enters the small intestine for further digestion and absorption. Okay, for further digestion and absorption. So, after, so here we have the mouth, or the space behind the mouth all the way here. This is called pharynx, okay? So then it goes into the pharynx. And then it goes into this pipe that leads it to the stomach, and that is called the esophagus. And through the esophagus, it's going to go into the stomach. Uh, this will be repeated in its own chapter. After the stomach, which breaks it down into a liquid, it's going to go into the small intestines, which is our topic today. So small intestine, uh, they have two functions. Number one, they do digestion. Okay, they also help in digestion of food, which is not our topic, so we're just going ignore, to ignore that function. But secondly, they are adapted for absorption of food. Pretty much all of the glucose and all of the amino acids uh, are absorbed in the small intestine. So how are they um, adapted for their function? Let's, uh, let's get a portion of small intestine and show you. So if I were to make a small intestine, here's the, here's the small intestine. Its walls have folds, okay? The walls of the intestines, small intestines, have folds, which increases the surface area for greater absorption, okay? The folds are called villi. So these are called villi, these are folds, and they help absorb the food. Secondly, if I were to zoom in on this villi, right? If I were to zoom in on each of the villi, so I'm just going to zoom in on this uh, villus over there, these villi contain, f uh, their cells contain uh, further microvilli, even smaller extensions of the cell membrane uh, of, uh, of these cells, which means that there is even a greater surface area, not just the villi, but also the microvilli, are contributing towards the absorption of, uh, of food here. Okay, so in the lumen, if you've got glucose, right, you've got amino acids, which help make proteins, and you want to absorb them, you have increased surface area due to villi. And on top of this, you've got microvilli, which also increase the surface area to volume ratio for more efficient absorption. Um, now the second thing, uh, or the third thing I, I, sh I should say, is that they have active transport proteins as well. Not only uh, do they have an increased surface area, they also have active transport proteins to be able to absorb uh, food when it gets in, in low concentrations. So for example, if we start with uh, glucose and amino acids in high concentrations, let me just redraw this in purple here, you have high concentration in the beginning, right? And then after a while, you get low concentration here and high concentration inside the cells in, of, the, of the intestine. So how are you going to get the, the little bit of glucose and amino acids that are left still in the intestinal lumen to go into the body? Well, you have to have some sort of proteins to pull this in, right? And we actually do have those proteins, and those are called active transport proteins, which help in pulling in of these uh, uh, 
from a low concentration grade, uh, from a low concentration to a high concentration using energy pulling in, in, in pulling in of these uh, glucose and amino acids. So that is the third adaptation. Adaptation number one, they have villi, which increase surface area to volume ratio. Number two, they have microvilli on their cells even, which further increase the surface area to volume ratio. Number three, they have active transport proteins so that they're able to absorb the little glucose and amino acids that are left against the concentration gradient. Initially, you'll have diffusion, of course. So initially, you'll have diffusion um, of this. And then once the diffusion is over, now you have the active transport. Okay, now on top of this, as food is entering into the body, you need to remove it so that the concentration gradient is maintained. So food is moving in uh, through these cells into the body. You need to have blood vessels here. So you actually do have blood vessels here. And they're going to take away proteins, I mean amino acids, and glucose very quickly away from these uh, these villi, okay, so that a concentration gradient is maintained. So all the villi, the small intestines, are richly supplied by blood vessels so that any food that you absorb, glucose, amino acids, is quickly taken away, maintaining the concentration gradient. Number, number two, you also have something called lymphatic vessels. Lymphatic vessels, they contain um, a watery-like fluid called tissue fluid, and lymphatic vessels... Uh, more on these later, but basically what you need to know is that there's a fluid that is watery and it can that's called lymph, and they have their own vessels, and those are called lymphatic vessels. And they take away fats. So fats will go, any fats that be absorbed, they're going to go into the lymphatic vessels, which are going to take them away. While any glucose and amino acids that be absorbed, that's going to go into the blood vessels. So that's four adaptations so far. Microvilli, villi, active transport, and uh, richly supplied by blood vessels and lymphatic vessels. The fifth adaptation, which is very simple, is that the diffusion distance is very small. The intestinal epithelium actually is only one cell thick. Right? There's only one cell thick absorption uh, epithelium that is absorbing all of this. So that's the, the fifth adaptation. which means that this decreases the diffusion distance for the molecules to move across. Okay, I hope you guys understand this. If you, if you are having any trouble understanding this, you can repeat the video as many times as you want, and you can read the notes. Um, and yeah, so let's move on. So again, um, here's an image of an intestinal epithelium over here. At the top, we have the intestine, right? and look at how many folds it has, and then the, each of those folds further have these uh, cells that have microvilli, and they are richly supplied by these blood vessels, lymphatics, uh, and arterioles. So very quickly, a read to the adaptations. They have these folds, they have villi, they have microvilli, they have a very thin epithelial cell layer, they have rich blood supply, they have lymphatic vessels, and of course they have numerous mitochondria to be able to assist them in active transport on top of having the active transport proteins. Okay? Plant roots refer to the root hair cells which was finished already in the previous video um, and PDF, so we already finished this, so I'm not just gonna go, uh, I'm not gonna go into it uh, all that much. And, and next up we have leaves. Leaves, you know, are organs and uh, that are that perform photosynthesis because they are exposed to sunlight. Now leaves also have this adaptation for gas exchange uh, because remember when we were talking about chloroplasts, we said that chloroplasts uh, need carbon dioxide and water to make glucose and oxygen. That carbon dioxide has to come from somewhere and it actually comes from the air outside. For it to come from the air outside, it needs to enter the leaves, which means leaves have to be adapted for some sort of gas exchange so that CO2 can come in to the leaf. Also, because you're producing oxygen, you want the oxygen to leave. And so leaves are also a site of gas exchange. The leaves site of photosynthesis and gas exchange for plants. At daytime, water and oxygen 
in the leaves diffuses out through the stomata and CO2 diffuses in for photosynthesis. So how do leaves work? Basically, uh, this image shows you a cross-section of a leaf. So that's the top side here, and you'll have sunlight that is landing on this part. And, and what you have within the leaf is you, you have xylem vessels that are bringing in the water. So here's the xylem vessel. I'm just going to label it. This is xylem. Remember xylem from the previous video? It brings in water to the leaf. So xylem is bringing in water here. Water is coming in to the leaf. That's number one. Number two, as sunlight is uh, landing on the cells on, off the leaf, especially the cells at the top here. These cells at the top are called palisade cells. We repeat this in its own chapter. They perform a lot of photosynthesis. So because they perform a lot of photosynthesis, they produce a lot of oxygen as well, okay? They produce oxygen as well. And they take in CO2. So CO2 is being absorbed here. And of course, for photosynthesis, they also take in some water. The water is also being absorbed by the palisade cells and some other cells inside the rest of the leaf. The palisade cell layer is called the palisade mesophyll, together as a tissue. Similarly, over here, in the middle part of the leaf, we have the spongy mesophyll. The spongy mesophyll is called spongy because uh, it's got these ear spaces in between the cells. So you see these little gaps between the cells? That's because it's, uh, it's, it's adapted for gas exchange, this area. And it's got these ear spaces through which uh, gases can diffuse from one place to another. So this is called the spongy mesophyll. It contains, again, photosynthetic cells, but it is spongy in nature, which means that it's got ear spaces in between it. A f um, another thing that's present in the spongy mesophyll is that it's got a thin layer of moisture as well. Okay, not only does it have air spaces, it also has a thin layer of moisture. So how is gas exchange actually going to occur? Well, let's have a look at oxygen first. Remember, oxygen is being produced in the uh, in the photosynthetic cells, may it be palisade cells or may, may it be cells of the spongy mesophyll. If oxygen is being produced, there is high concentration of oxygen on the inside, low concentration on the outside. So oxygen, if, uh, if provided a, a pathway to leave the leaf, then it's going to leave the leaf. And that pathway is provided by guard cells. Guard cells are usually present on the underside of leaves, and they contain um, they contain an air space in between them, and that's called a stoma, plural is stomata. So basically, stomata are, are air spaces that are formed by guard cells, uh, typically present on the underside of leaves, which allow the gases to diffuse in and out down their concentration gradient. So right now we're talking about oxygen, remember. During the daytime, oxygen is being produced by photosynthesis, so it's going to move from inside the leaf to outside the leaf, and that is the movement of oxygen. What about CO2? Well, CO2 is being used inside the leaf. So because leaf is taking in CO2 to conduct photosynthesis, CO2 is going to move from outside to inside, down its concentration gradient, okay? Now the third thing is water. Water that is coming up the xylem actually is, uh, uh, it's more than required for the photosynthesis. So a lot of the water also is going to leave out through the stomata. All right, by the way, when this water is going to leave the stomata, it's going to generate a suction pole in the xylem to pull more water all the way from the roots. And this, this uh, diffusion of water outside from the stomata in the leaves is termed as transpiration. So again, let me repeat this. The leaves are the organs that are photosynthetic in nature and they, ha they, are, they are adapted for gas exchange. At daytime, 
you have photosynthesis occurring, which means we need CO2 to come in. So as cells in the leaf, palisade cells or spongy mesophyll cells, perform photosynthesis, they use carbon dioxide. Pulling in or generating a concentration gradient for CO2 to move in from outside to inside. At the same time, they produce oxygen, and which, which means that the concentration of oxygen increases on the inside of leaf, allowing it to diffuse from inside to outside. Water comes up through the xylem, and more water comes up than is required for photosynthesis, so it also diffuses down its concentration gradient outside the leaf. Okay, and that is termed transpiration for water. Also, when water leaves, it generates a suction pull, pulling in more water from the xylem all the way from the roots. The, uh, the thin moisture film on top of the air spaces facilitate the exchange of uh, gases because remember, gases have to be, uh, you have to have a, gases are water soluble. And so if you provide a layer of moisture, it facilitates the gases to uh, to dissolve and to be able to um, to be able to be exchanged so some of the features of uh, the leaves and the leaves again they have a large surface area number one uh, for maximum sunlight exposure and efficient gas exchange um, they have a thin structure so they're not very thick which minifies, minimizes diffusion distance for gases within leaf cells so for example if gas is coming from the stomata it doesn't take it very long to reach the palisade cells because the leaves are very, very thin. They have stomata. Stomata are formed by guard cells, and these are air spaces. So these are small pores on leaf surfaces for CO2 intake and an oxygen water release. Guard cells. Guard cells, they surround stomata, and they regulate their opening and closing to control gas exchange um, and also reduce water loss. Remember that if uh, too much water loss occurs, then plant will wilt. So you cannot have this water leaving all the time. You have to close the guard cells at some point. Uh, guard cells usually close at uh, at nighttime to prevent any water loss because at that time you're not doing any photosynthesis. So there's no point in opening the guard cells and losing all that water without taking in CO2 because you're not doing photosynthesis. So usually guard cells will close the stomata um, at, at the nighttime. Spongy mesophyll tissue. Again, spongy mesophyll is very spongy. It's got those air spaces, so it contains air spaces to facilitate diffusion of gases. Also, it contains that thin layer of moisture. Xylem tissue. Xylem brings in water from the roots to diffuse out the stomata, and therefore it maintains a uh, concentration gradient. So um, here's a question for you guys. Which cells in the leaves produce the most glucose? Code this question and your nickname with your answer. Okay, so the last topic in this uh, particular video, which will conclude the chapter, and we've pretty much started, um, we've done two chapters, really. We've done cells as well as we've done the exchange of substances. So really, we've concluded two chapters in two videos, which is very big. Um, and it's a big achievement for you guys as well who have been listening to this. So fish gills. Um, fish gills is the last topic in the exchange of substances chapter. Fish gills are covered by a flap called the operculum. So if you've ever seen a fish, you, you've probably seen this little flap that covers uh, the gills, right? And that's called the operculum. So that is the operculum. If you open the operculum, then the gills will be exposed, right? And water will, will move into the gills to, to allow the exchange of gases to occur. So opening operculum allows water to flow in between the gills. So what do gills have? Gills actually have a large surface area for efficient diffusion of gases. Let me sh let me show you gills first. And um, by, by the way, they also have continuous rich blood supply. So let me show you gills. Here are gills. So again, when you open the operculum, water is going to rush in between the gills. And when it rushes in between the gills, water contains high concentrations of oxygen, right? Water has high oxygen low CO2, while deoxygenated blood, for example, is colored in blue, uh, this blood has low oxygen, high carbon dioxide. So exchange between the water, it's coming in between the gills, uh, and the deoxygenated blood occurs. And therefore, oxygen is going to move into the blood, and CO2 is going to move outside of the blood. Okay, you understand this? 
Now, if you look at the structure of gills, you see that these look very, very thin. And that, may, that means that they have a lot of uh, surface area as compared to their volume, which increases the rate of diffusion of gases. Number two, they are very richly supplied by these capillaries, these blood vessels, which means that there's always a uh, fresh blood coming in and blood leaving, which means that there is a steep concentration gradient that is maintained in gills to allow for diffusion of gases, okay? So again, let's quickly read this. Fish gills have a large surface area for efficient diffusion of gases and continuous rich blood supply to maintain a steep concentration gradient. And therefore, these features allow fish to absorb oxygen from water and remove CO2 into the water for aerobic respiration. And that brings us to the closure of uh, these two chapters, cells and the exchange of substances. A couple of memes maybe to uh, reward ourselves. You may be thinking, oh geez, somebody help, that guy is drowning. Fear not, he uses his gills to breathe underwater. <laughs> but that's not even funny, right? Dude, that wasn't funny. I'm leaving, right? It's also time for me to leave because this video is over. So yeah, I'm going to leave. And if you have any questions, just let me know in the comments. And you can buy these notes by contacting through the WhatsApp link provided below. And if you want to get private coaching for your specific needs, again, you can contact us right now using the WhatsApp link. And I'll see you guys in the next one. Let me know what you think about these videos, okay? Take care. Bye.